This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to episode number 31 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to join us on the Homestead Journey My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And folks, when I say it is beautiful upstate New York, let me tell you something. The last couple of days have been almost picture perfect. Now, Friday was a little bit of a different story. We did have a serious storm come through here. Um, uh, Not too far away, actually, a tornado was confirmed to have touched down. Friends of ours, just a little bit north of us, uh, lost trees and power. We actually lost power for about four hours on Friday. Um, But thankfully, there wasn't a whole lot of damage here on the homestead. But folks around us, trees down. We drove by one trailer, and it looked like the top had just been peeled back like a sardine can. It was just, it was amazing. Um, but thankfully here on our homestead, we did not have any kind of damage like that. We had a few limbs down, some things blown around, but other than that, everything is great. Now, losing power did cause a bit of a problem for me, and that is that I had some eggs in the incubator, and uh, I just decided to feed those to the pigs. Some people said I, afterwards, some people told me that maybe I should have just gone ahead and let them ride and see what happened. But I just decided eh, after four hours of not having the correct heat, they probably weren't going to be any good. They're not going to be viable. And so I got rid of them. But other than that, we're good here on the homestead. And uh, so thankful that, um, that we had no damage and power was out for a relatively short period of time. Anyhow, let's jump into this week's Homestead Happenings, and I will bring you up to date with what we've been doing here on 3B Farm and Homestead. So as you may remember from last week's episode, we lost our upright freezer last week. It just quit working on us. Now, as I'm recording this podcast, we are right in the midst of this whole COVID thing. And because of that, people are stocking up on their food. And because of that, the freezers are out of stock at all of the big box stores and even the smaller retailers. Thankfully, I was able to find a used freezer on Facebook Marketplace. And my son and I brought it home last week. But it was in a bit of a situation. And if you follow us on Facebook or if you follow us on Instagram, and if you're not, you should. (laughs) Um, the Homestead Journey podcast, both places, you'll be able to find us. Um, But I put up some pictures of kind of before and after of cleaning that freezer up. And thankfully, not only did it clean up well, but it freezes well, it works well. And I am very, very thankful to have that because in two weeks, we've got some meat birds that are freezer bound. And I was a little worried um, because we did not have room for meat birds in our chest freezer. Now, losing that freezer did have a bit of a positive effect, and that is that I had some back fat and some leaf lard that had been in the freezer since last fall that I just hadn't gotten around to rendering. And so this week, my wife and I chopped it up, put it in crock pots and roasting pans, rendered it down, and so now we have some more lard uh, to use for baking and for cooking and for frying and maybe even making some soap, Um, and so very, very thankful for that. The other big thing that we did here on the homestead this week is I finally got fruit trees. I finally got some fruit trees and got them planted this week. Uh, we ordered from Fedco Trees and I got some grapevines, which I got planted without any issue. Uh, but the rest of the stuff, maybe not quite as pretty of a situation. <laughs> So with my raspberries, I ordered some raspberries. For some reason, I thought I ordered 20 raspberries. What I actually ordered was 20 blackberries, and I ordered 10 raspberries. But crazy me dug 20 holes for raspberries, and I only had 10 to fill them. And then moving on, 
to my apple trees. Um, if, if you're not familiar with apple trees and, and really fruit trees in general, you have what's called rootstock. The rootstock is what determines the size of the tree. And then onto that rootstock is what they graft. They graft scion wood, I think is what it's called. And that's what determines the variety of fruit that you're going to get. And if I'm wrong on that, please correct me, but I'm pretty sure that's how it works. So you have these rootstocks that, again, determine the overall size of the tree. And they, they range from the standard rootstock, which a full-size tree, all the way down to the dwarfs, uh, which are a smaller tree. And the way it works is obviously the smaller the tree, the closer together you can plant your trees. So I ordered, there's two kind of a semi-dwarf rootstocks. One is called B118 or Bud 118, and it will result in a tree that's about 85 to 90 percent of the of a uh, full-size tree. And then M111 will result in a tree that's about 65 to 80 percent of standard size. Now, I wanted all of my trees to be the M111s, but because this was Fedco's end of the season sale, I could only get certain varieties in the Bud 118. I thought, no big deal. I'll kind of fudge it a little bit, but I'll make sure I got the spacings right and, and everybody will be happy. So with the M111, you can plant them about 15 to 20 feet apart. With the Bud 118, you're supposed to plant them about 20 to 25 feet apart. So my, my thought process was that I would plant them, the, the M111s, at the 15 feet kind of spacing. And I'd fudge a little bit on the, the Bud 118, maybe go 18 to 20, but somewhere in that range. Well, then it went downhill from there. I, I went to measure it out. I didn't take a tape measure out. I just thought I'll just pace it off. And for me, a pace is about three feet. So the pacing for the, the smaller semi-dwarfs, the M111, would be five paces, right? Five times three is 15. Except for some reason in my poor little pea brain, I, I went with three paces. So right off the bat, I had my spacing wrong. I had it at 9 feet instead of 15 feet. And then not only that, but I got the rootstocks backwards in my head. And I thought the B118 was the rootstock that could be planted closer together. So I proceeded to plant those and then started to work on my spacing for my M111s when I realized, A, I had my spacings totally wrong to begin with, and B, I had the rootstock backwards. So I planted trees multiple times this week. I dug whole, I mean, it was absolutely ridiculous. So lesson learned, or I shouldn't say lesson learned. It's a lesson that I need to learn, that I need to slow down and not bull into things. Because when I try to rush through things, it always takes me way longer because I screw stuff up. I dig more holes than I need to. I dig holes in the wrong spot. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But at least I got, I've got apple trees. I've got grapevines. I've got raspberries planted here on the homestead. I'm very excited about that. Now, as I was planting the last tree, my 15-year-old son came wandering on by and he said, Dad, you finally planted apple trees. I said, yes. He said, how long is it going to be until we get apples? I said, well, it could be up to five years. And he said, but dad, at that point, I'm going to be in college. And I said, yeah. He said, if you would have just listened to me back when I was seven years old, when I wanted apple trees, we'd be enjoying fruit right now. Aye, 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 folks. Out of the mouths of babes. I guess the old Chinese proverb is the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is now. Well, this week was the now. This week I also planted asparagus, so excited about that. That came as part of my order from Fedco. So I got that in the Ruth Stout bed, dug a trench, and uh, that just 
I'm very excited about that. I also ordered some Comfrey, as I mentioned last week, from Harold Thornbro when I was talking to him. I actually ordered it from him, and uh, so I got that planted this week. And then today was that day in spring that I look forward to. Today was our last average frost date. Woohoo! And so today I uh, really got to work in the garden. I started putting transplants in, started getting my beans and, and just so many of that, so much of that warm weather, um, the, those warm weather crops, I started getting those in. And so we have three of our raised beds fully planted and uh, we'll be moving on down the way this week. Hopefully by the end of this week, we will have all of the raised beds planted and then we can move on up to the uh, Ruth Stout bed and uh, get that planted as well. So very, very excited about that. So much stuff going on here on the homestead. Animal updates. Uh, we had another gosling hatch this week. So we have we actually had three goslings hatch. One didn't make it. Um, our meat birds are doing well. Uh, the baby pigs are doing well. The turkeys are moved to, the, to their turkey coop uh, home. We'll be setting up some fence for them, and then they'll have a nice long run. Um, so just things here on the homestead are just going like gangbusters right now, and uh, very excited about it. I just love this time of the year, and uh, so just very, very happy with how things are progressing here on 3B Farm and Homestead. All right, let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. This week is International Heritage Breeds Week. This is a week that is focused on the importance of heritage breeds, and it is promoted by the Livestock Conservancy. And so I am so pleased to have joining me someone who is very, very passionate about heritage breed animals. They have played an incredible role in her homesteading journey. She is the author of the award-winning book, Saving the Guinea Hogs, The Recovery of an American Homestead Breed. Welcome to the Homestead Journey podcast, Kathy R. Payne. So glad to have you with us. Well, thank you, Brian. I'm so excited to be here. And before we jump in and we kind of talk a little bit about your journey into homesteading, um, this coming week is a very, very special week. It's International Heritage Breeds Week, and I know that means a lot to you. It's really influenced your journey into homesteading. So could you just share a little bit about what that means and, and why it's important? Yes, I can. Every year, since 2015, the Livestock Conservancy has had a Heritage Breeds Week. The first year, it was just for the Livestock Conservancy, and it was called Heritage Breeds Week. But the second year, 2016, they changed it. They are interconnecting with conservators all over the world, and now it is International Heritage Breeds Week. Heritage Breeds are sometimes called local or traditional breeds. And they're the breeds that my grandparents and their parents and grandparents would have bred. I'm 67 years old now, so uh, they've been around for a long time. Generally, if you think of breeds that were around in the early 1950s, like when I was born, those would be considered heritage breeds. Now, not all heritage breeds are rare or endangered breeds, and the Livestock Conservancy monitors the ones that are rare or endangered. So what makes the heritage breeds special? The unique quality of those old-timey breeds were that they were adapted to their local environment by specific selection by their breeders, and they tend to be resistant to pressures in that area, quite easy to manage, and whether the environment was hot or cold, humid or dry, wooded or grassy, the animals that survived and thrived in those areas were evolved to continue to live and thrive in it. And that's something that's been taken out of the breeds that are used for the commercial production of probably 99% of the meat in our country, because those animals are now bred on concrete, indoors, in climate-controlled situations. They're not pastured and they don't forage. So that makes them very, very different. And I would say not different in a good way, right? There's not a lot of biodiversity in the commercial breeds, and biodiversity is really a key to the heritage breeds. 
biodiversity in the heritage breeds is just amazing, and they they look amazing, and they're almost never solid white. So that's a big difference. The genetics that these animals and other heritage breeds possess are living time capsules, and they could hold the key to the future of agriculture. This is because our climate is changing at a rate never seen before. Modern breeds are less resilient when facing environmental changes, and you know we're dealing with a lot of those. The heritage breeds retain some of those traits that they developed for survival and self-sufficiency, including resiliency, the ability to breed naturally, high levels of fertility, forage, foraging skills, and resistance to diseases and parasites. So tell me a little bit about the Livestock Conservancy and its role in helping these heritage breed animals. The Livestock Conservancy was founded 43 years ago in 1977, and its mission is to protect endangered livestock and poultry breeds from extinction. About how many breeds are they monitoring? They currently monitor almost 200 breeds in the United States. The Livestock Conservancy's website states that worldwide, about one livestock breed is lost to extinction every month. And that comes from the World Health Organization's research. You're saying one um, livestock breed a month? Yes, in the last 15 years, over 150 breeds have been lost worldwide of livestock breeds. Now, the good news is that none of those are in the United States. So since the Livestock Conservancy was founded, and that's been for over four decades now, they have worked really hard with the breed associations and with the breeders and helping just in innumerable ways. And because of that, these breeds have been maintained in the United States in the last 40 years. Well, that is great news So with the heritage breeds, what makes heritage breeds special? So each breed carries half of its genetics in common with others of its species. So the guinea hogs that you have share 50% of the genetics of any hog, even the, the commercial hogs. But the other half of the genetics is distinct to the breed and cannot be recovered if the breed dies out. So if the guinea hogs, for example, were going to go extinct, then all those unique traits that make them uniquely guinea hogs will be lost to all pigs. And I'm really concerned because we've got a big problem with African swine flu in the Orient, uh, in Asia, there are pigs dying. Last year, China lost 50% of its hogs because of this disease. Now, I can't guarantee that any one breed or any one pig in this country would be resistant from that disease, but it's more likely the larger the biodiversity, the bigger the gene pool, that some of those pigs that are the old Tommy pigs could survive that. So, if there were any kind of a drought, if there were any kind of a problem with the meat packing plants, well, guess what's happening now? Exactly. If the meat packing plants aren't operational, then who's going to raise the pork for this country? And I think we're starting to see the answer to that right now. Yeah, and I think to that point, um, when you look at these commercial breeds, and not to pick on them, but when you look at these commercial breeds that have been raised in more of these climate controlled settings and where, um, you know, they, they heavily rely on uh, um, artificial insemination and, and all of those kinds of things. Um, if there is a problem with the meat supply, uh, as we are seeing right now, and we had only those commercial hogs to fall back on, um, they're not going to adapt very well to living outdoors and living uh, out on pasture and uh, per- perhaps the more natural breeding cycles of life. Is that a fair assessment? That's a very fair assessment. They are not even breeds. They're commercial strains. The strains and the genetics are owned by the corporations. So it's not something that somebody else could reproduce if they wanted to. But they're also, they're white. In the southeast, in the summertime, out on pasture, they'd be sunburned. They've never, they've never lived on grass. They don't They've never rooted. They've never bred naturally. So 
and they're also very, very closely related because they are using insemination, probably just have a couple of boars semen that they're using to inseminate everybody. So it's it's a really bad situation. They are not at all adapted for pasture. Raising. And so then certainly not even just with the pigs, but with livestock in general, the fact is that it's important for us to conserve these breeds because we need to be able, we don't know what part of the genes, so to speak, we may need in the future to deal with certain situations that might arise that, that we're, we're not able to foresee right now. That's correct. And it's biodiversity is key in our planet. And the more biodiverse we are, the more healthy we are as a planet. And so by removing the biodiversity, then we are weakening our ecosystems. And, and at the end of the day... And farms have ecosystems uh, absolutely. too. Absolutely. That, that's, that's a critical thing to keep in mind. But at the end of the day, variety is a spice of life. Um, and, and so the, the more variety we have, That's true. I think the better off we are. Absolutely. And the thing is, once something is lost, you can't just bring it back. We can't just bring back the dinosaurs because if we needed them, you know, we can't just bring back the dodo bird. It's mm -hmm. gone. Yeah, and that and that's and that's something that that is very very tragic. And again, as um, as homesteaders, and this is being a homestead um, centric podcast, I guess the question is, why should this matter to us? Um, you know, we think of it from the standpoint of yes, we we, you know, if if African flying swine flu were to come around. Um, may, maybe that's the reason why it should should matter to us. But should it matter to us beyond just those kind of high level things? Absolutely, it should. Um, can you hang on to that question? And I want to just talk just a little bit more about um, the sure. Heritage Breeds absolutely. Week. Yeah, they absolutely. came out with a flyer okay, today. Great. Okay, it says, mark your calendar for International Heritage Breeds Week, May 17th through 23rd, and you can engage in the Global Week of Awareness by sharing a story and following hashtag Heritage Breeds Week on social media. So if anybody wants to follow that and they're on Instagram or Facebook, they can follow hashtag Heritage Breeds Week. And repeat your question, please. I'll get back. Sure. So, so um, <laughs> to that you know, coming back to... To the idea of us as homesteaders, why should um, this matter to homesteaders? Yes. You know, we we th yes, we think about African swine flu um, and maybe some major disease like that impacting us, but uh, and that and that certainly should be concerning to us. No, there's no doubt about that. Um, but are there other reasons why, as homesteaders, we should be concerned and, and consider raising heritage breeds versus more of these um, improved breeds, so to speak? Absolutely. Like I said, there are lots of old breeds that are heritage breeds that are not necessarily endangered heritage breeds. But some homesteaders, many homesteaders, do choose the, the breeds that are more endangered. And that's because... They're easy to manage. They are specific to small homesteads because that's what existed in this country prior to 1950, where we had a high population of people that were farmers. And so these were animals that were adapt to be on family farms, family farms the children. Mm -hmm. So if you want to raise animals that are easy to manage around children that are good on a small amount of land that can forage for some of their own food that are possibly multi-purpose then those are very appropriate for homesteaders so what are some of the things that homesteaders can do to help conserve rare breeds there's an article by allison martin who's the executive director of the Livestock Conservancy that's in the 2020 Rare Breeds and Products Resource Guide. And she wrote an article about why registration matters. So if you really want to conserve rare breed, then you have to have a record of where it came from to be able to count that animal in the future then you need to have it registered. So if you just want to buy some feeder pigs, grow them out and butcher them, and you want to just test the waters with a rare breed, you can do that. But if you purchase those feeder stock from somebody who owns registered stock, then that registered person gets some money for those feeder pigs 
that he, he or she can use to continue conserving the breed. Also, if you purchase registered breeding stock, because you say you want to conserve the red breeds, and you join the association, and then you register your breeding stock, you can have the option of selling registered breeding stock and keep them going. But once they are not registered, they might be crossbred, they might be poor quality, and so it's not helping the breed move forward. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. I 100% agree with that because it's one of the things that as I've gotten involved with the American guinea hog that we'll, we'll talk about here in a little bit more in depth, but um, it's, you know, it's really become clear to me that the, the registration, number one, it helps us understand kind of the history of the pig. And, and then in the future, when you want to breed for certain traits, certain lines have certain traits. So it does make um, that decision-making process uh, a little bit easier. But, but beyond that, there are so many examples of poor quality crosses or even, you know, they're, they are 100% mm-hmm. American guinea hog, but they don't have the qualities that we as breeders would be looking for, but people are just pumping them out and putting them out onto the market. And in essence, what that ends up doing, besides the fact that it floods the market in that particular area but it also gives the animal, whether it's the American guinea hog or another breed altogether, it gives it a bad name. And so people are going to be less likely to want to raise that breed because they think it is X, Y, or Z when they didn't really have a a true experience with a high quality example of what that breed is been developed to offer um, over really over generations. Right. And that unregistered animal that might be promoted as a guinea hog, but it's unregistered, might not be a guinea hog at all, or only might be partly guinea hog. So what the breed association can do then is help you with some breed promotion. And by having that pedigree and having each animal tagged or identified through an ear notch or other characteristic, then you can keep records of your stock and track carcass quality, mothering ability, genetic defects, and litter size. All those impact meat production. So somebody wants to produce a particular pig breed or sheep breed or rabbit breed, you want to know these things. And by having a record and a registration and just a you know computer software to track your animals, then you can raise better meat animals or raise better fiber animals or raise better breeding stock. And you you don't have that control if you just buy something unknown and you don't know where it came from or what are the characteristics you may want to improve. Along with, with that, I think that it's important to keep in mind you don't have to be a breeder of of a particular breed, so to speak, in order to help conserve it. Um, people who buy feeder pigs for me, uh, and all they mm-hmm. want to do is raise feeder pigs. Obviously, they I would hope by now they have a level of confidence that I am providing a, a, a purebred pig, um, so that what they are getting is American guinea hog. But by mm-hmm. supporting me in that effort, even if they choose not to have a breeding program in and of themselves, they are helping to conserve the breed. That is correct. And some homesteaders might want to learn spinning or knitting or weaving, but perhaps not have the size of the homestead they they need to be able to raise sheep. So there's a program that the Livestock Conservancy has, and it's run by a homesteader that's working with the Livestock Conservancy. And you can learn about different heritage breeds of sheep and purchase products such as wool or yarn and then make products using the wool or yarn from I think it's 15 different breeds over a period of three years and there's some people that accomplished that task last year for in six months so it's a way that you can support the people that are doing the work and you can learn a hobby that's homestead related and you can produce clothes for your family that came from wool that was grown by another family and you can 
really learn about the different heritage breeds and the different textures of the wool and the different characteristics. So it's just been amazing and it has taken off like crazy. Another way I think that people can also support heritage breeds um, and, and breed conservation is simply by becoming a member of the Livestock Conservancy. Absolutely. Yeah, it's only $45 a year and they do so much work. And they also do a lot of fundraising with private entities and so that money gets p- multiplied and then beyond that and i know this is something that you know i i i see periodically you will post pictures of of various restaurants that you've gone to that are serving heritage breed meat products and and so that's something else it's another way that you can help support the the conservation of breeds is by supporting restaurants that are doing more of the farm to table but that are very uh, conscientious of of the breeds and the qualities of the breeds and how that translates to culinary uses. Yes, and that's another thing that the Livestock Conservancy is going to get into with they recently got a $500,000 grant and they're going to use it to support breeds, breed associations and their breed promotion efforts, including promoting their meat and other products uh, such as the, the wool. And so they're really, there's really going to be a big push to say, like right now, there's a push to brand Mishan pork in Asaba Island pork. And I like to see that kind of a push for the, the guinea hog pork as well. Absolutely. And if you're used to eating the traditional, and I use huge air quotes here, but the traditional store-bought pork, that lean other white meat, you're going to find, you know, the American guinea hog or, or any of the other heritage breeds to have a, a far different taste and texture. And in my opinion, a far superior taste and texture than what you're used to finding in the store. And I think that really holds true. At least it's been my experience, whether it's with chicken or duck or, you know, any of those things. Obviously, I think the way that you, you, you raise it and you manage it is, is certainly a part of it. But each breed has, brings to the table, literally to the table, um, different qualities and benefits. That is so true. And people don't understand that pork is not pork is not pork. We have such generic and lack of biodiversity in our food supplies that people don't realize that they have a choice. They can, they can eat something that's better, that has a better flavor, better texture, that it's different and it's even healthier because of the way it's raised out in the sunshine and fed on pasture grasses. And most people can relate to the difference between an heirloom tomato harvested in June from the backyard versus the tomatoes that they get in the grocery store or that are sliced on their burgers at McDonald's. That, that's a great example. That's something people can relate to. And it's, it's not even close to the not same. Even. And it's the same thing eating a pastured pork. The color, the texture, the quality of the fat and everything is different. And I'm, I've gotten to be a food snob. I like piney wood cattle, and that's my beef. <laughs> and so I really love my neighbor who raises this land race breed of cattle that's indigenous to the southeast, and I really love the flavor, and that's what I eat. And I really got spoiled with my Gulf Coast sheep, which is a multi-purpose breed, and I loved its wool, and I sold a all of my wool, it was very much in demand, but sometimes you had to slaughter one, and it was delicious. Even a 10-year-old ewe that had led a long life and provided many, many lambs. I was afraid of the mutton flavor, but it, it was not muttony, it was not strong, it was mild, and it was delicious. So you just have to try it to experience. So I hope I inspire some people to go to their local farmers and see if they can find some heritage meat. <laughs> and, and I think especially right now with the, the situation that we're, we're facing where, and it's in, and quite frankly, it's not that we lack a supply of animals to be processed right now. It's that it, at least from my understanding of it, the, the way that our food system has been architected, the bottleneck is with the processors. Um, but 
there, there's not, there's not necessarily a lack of, of the meat, but having said that in many places, and I know it's not everywhere in many places, there are smaller producers um, who are producing uh, the meat from heritage breeds. And, and so if you can't find it at your big box supermarket, you know, go to the farmer's market, look around and see if you can find a smaller butcher, because in a lot of those places, you're going to be able to start finding this heritage breed meat. Yes. Now, this might be a little bit off point, but I came across a news article this week about the Prime Act, which has to do with allowing custom slaughter. Yes. State by state. Yes, that's the. Would you like some information on that, or do you have that? You no, know, that, that. Well, absolutely. I think it's it's a, it's a great point to bring up here. That's the um the bill that uh, um Thomas Massey from Kentucky has been, uh, I think, submitting for the last several years, and he's he's really trying yes. to get a lot of um especially now to really bring that to attention. So certainly, um, yeah, go ahead and just explain a little bit about that because I think that's something important, whether it passes now, at least it brings it to the forefront of people's minds to understand that a lot of what we're seeing here with regards to supply chain issues has to do with reg- at least in my opinion, a regulatory um, burden that, 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 it, that is, that is cre- to, in essence created this problem. And, and this may be a way out of it, the prime. Absolutely. Act. When I had, was raising meat on my homestead, we, I found that there were two problems that almost everybody had. Number one was bad internet connection. <laughs> I could not be having this, connect, this conversation for you in Zoom dependently if I was out in the country in a rural area. And number two was a lack of meat processors because it was it's such a burden on a small farmer to find a meat processor that's closer than a three-hour drive from their farm and even harder to find one that's USDA inspected. So we have USDA inspected and we have state inspected in Georgia. And there are different regulations and state inspected can only be sold within the state. But 50 years ago, it used to be that you could go to the deer processor, just a small, unregulated local meat processor. And you could take your cow or your pigs or your sheep, if, if they took those animals and processed them for a family, they could, you could also sell them to somebody that was not your family. And they were safe. There was not a problem with them. They were clean. But 50 years ago, they took the rights of the states to make those decisions, and they made more USDA regulations. And so these small places, because of the regulations that they do have and just all the different rules, they they started getting older and, you know, the kids didn't want to do the family business. They'd shut down. And it just got to where there aren't very many of them left. So right now, we have people with pigs that want to process them because people can't find park at the grocery store right now or they can't get some beef. They want to take their beef in to be processed. Their waiting list is going to December 31st here. Mm -hmm. So they have to plan three or four months in advance, but they've got animals now. And it's the same situation as in the meatpacking situation is that the local people can't process. Now, that's not because they're sick, because they're just real small plants, and they can, you know, they're not going to let anybody work when they're sick. When you're talking about six people working at a processing plant, everybody's pretty much family. And it's different than these companies that have 9,000 employees, and they just want to keep you working 24 hours a day. So they're much safer in that regard. They're not just cranking these things out, you know, a thousand animals in, in a day or anything. They're just really small. It, it, it's a family business. Locally owned. Yeah. It's a family business. Right. And so it's much safer. And the thing is, if you have problems with beef that comes from a cow that you just purchased whole and had it cut up in your freezer, you know who to go to because you have a problem. But if if you have unknown thousands of animals processed in a handful of plants in the country and one of them gets contaminated with E. coli, they mix them all in there. They don't know 
whose cows they're processing. They're all going to Tyson or to whatever the name of the processor is. And then what do you do? You have a recall of 3,000 pounds of beef because maybe one cow had a problem and it got into the works. So it's, it's even though that plant was USDA inspected, those inspectors don't have enough time in the day to really inspect every single thing that comes through. And you don't know where to go for the problem. You don't know the source, so you can fix it. So I don't think people realize that it, it's that much safer. No, and, and that, these are all great points. And, and I, I read somewhere, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was, it was something along the lines of when they implemented these regulations, you know, about 50 years ago with regards to this, at that point, there were 10,000 slaughterhouses across the United States. And now we are mm-hmm. down near about 2,000. Wow. So, yeah. you know, it, it shows you, and, and, and these are, and that is my understanding of those numbers. Um, and I'll try to find the article and link to it in the show notes. Um, but those numbers include, you know, the USDA and these custom state right here in New York state, they're called 5A processing plants. But now what's, what's very unique, I shouldn't say unique. It's, it's just, it becomes very confusing is that, in Georgia, it sounds to me like I could take uh, an animal to a state certified processing plant and I could still sell um, by the piece. So I could sell pork chops, I could sell sausage, I could sell whatever, as long as I did it within the boundaries of Georgia. Is that correct? Yes, it's it's called state inspected. Now, the rub is that they are, they're going to charge you $75 to get a meat handling license, you have to have uh, some kind of a freezer to transport with, and then you have to have a transportation license, and that's $75, and then you have to put your own label on it, and then that costs, you have to order like 350 labels in advance, and that costs money. So if you're a small producer that's just maybe selling, butchering and selling five pigs a year, you're going to have to add a huge amount to the price of your animals, even just to do that. And, and quite frankly, in my opinion, it, a lot of that does not come back to safety. This is just my opinion. Maybe I'm going a little. It's off. tax money. It, well, it's tax it's money. Tax and it's money. also, <laughs> if they can put those kind of regulations in place, then that ensures that the big boys kind of get the bigger piece of the pie. Um and, yeah. and and this all really comes back to, and we've talked about heritage breeding, and we've got, but this all comes back to that because, again, part of the conservation of heritage breeds for us is that they taste great. And, mm-hmm. But if it's, if it's difficult to process them, then it becomes that much more difficult for people to be able to experience that, to be able to appreciate that, and for us to ha- be able to have a, a supply chain where we can reliably sell the meat and m- maintain a profitable farm so that we continue the conservation of animals. Absolutely. So here's another thing that homesteaders can do. I personally didn't get into butchering beyond rabbits, but if people are set up to be homesteaders, if they really want to be independent of these issues politically, if they want to process their own cow or their own sheep or their own pig, they can do that. And that's perfectly legal. And it's just consumed for the family. It's not something that they could sell. Um, so that's something homesteaders can do is they can be independent of these processors. And another, and I think that's another benefit of these heritage breeds is that using the American guinea hog as an example, I'm not having to worry about processing a 400 or 600 pound hog. It's a manageable size that my family, my dad and I did our first pig up, not this past December, uh, the December before that. Um, it was a small one, but uh, it, it was a size where we could do it and I didn't have to worry about, you know, oh my goodness, is, is my house going to cave in because I'm swinging a huge hog off of it? Um, right. So I think that's definitely a, you know, a huge benefit to the heritage breeds is that not only are they generally speaking, and I can't speak to every heritage breed for sure, but a lot of them are a little bit smaller in size, which is perfect for a smaller homestead. But then when it comes time to process them, it's an easier 
an easier task to do and you're not having to go out and buy five freezers because you know you killed a, a 600 pound hog right <laughs> That's that's a good point. You know, going back to going back to the um, just just really quickly back to the state inspection here in in New York with regards to meat. If I want to sell by the piece in New York State, I have to go to a USDA processor. I cannot go to a state processor. The state processor can only take live animals, and that so I have to sell it on the hoof, and then they mm-hmm. process it. And the individual who's bought the, the, the pig from me then goes to the processor and picks it up from them directly. But, um, and so that, that creates some issues as well because, A, if I wanted to sell um, meat by the piece, now I am constrained by USDA process. Now, I'm very, very blessed that here where I'm at, within uh, an hour drive, I have at least three USDA inspected facilities. Wow. Um, and, and within an hour's drive, I have... Uh, at least two, what we call 5A, so state inspected facilities. Um, mm-hmm. So in my area, I am very blessed that I don't have to do the three hour one way drive. And, and I'm thankful for that. In fact, my, one of my 5A um, processing plants is less than a quarter of a mile from my house. Um, so very, very blessed with that regard. But again, if I wanted to sell it by the piece, then I am stuck in the USDA pipeline. And A, I don't have a whole lot of confidence in that pipeline to begin with. And I, I'm not speaking specifically to those facilities. I'm speaking to mm-hmm. the, the quote unquote safety regulations. But beyond that, a lot of those, the, the larger USDA facilities are not accustomed to dealing with heritage breeds. And so when you bring in an American guinea hog, they don't know, they really don't know what to do with it. Um, and they look at it and they say, well, that, that, that pig's so small, you'll, you know, one of the things I get told every time I take a, a pig to a different processor is, well, you won't get any bacon back. And then they're right. always shocked by the amount of bacon that's on an American guinea hog. Right. <laughs> yeah, they're different. They, they are. And, you know, with the American guinea hog, there's a lot more fat and, you know, a lot more lard. And, you know, and some people look at that and, and, and again, they're, they're perplexed by why, why you would want that. But for, for me, and again, you don't want to turn it into a lard ball, but for me, that's a good thing. But they just don't understand because they're used to dealing with more of the commercial type breeds or strains. Well, they think that meat is the only product from the hog, but lard it- it's a lard hog. I mean, the lard is why people raised them mm-hmm. was because they use lard for their candles and lard for, the, lard for the lamps and lard to grease their wheels and lard for frying. And it's still a great food product and it's mostly monosaturated. It's like olive oil and it, it, does, it has a high smoking point. So it's good for cooking in I just love the lard. It, it tastes great. It tastes great. Well, Kathy, this is really, I, I've really enjoyed um, our conversation here with regards to the Livestock Conservancy, International Heritage Breed Weeks, the importance of heritage breeds to homesteaders. And next week, on next week's episode, you and I are going to jump into how heritage breeds have really impacted your homesteading journey and the important role that they played in that. So thank you so much. Um, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to join us today on the Homestead Journey. And uh, is there anything else you'd like to say with regards to International Heritage Breeds Week? That's a bit of a mouthful, but International Heritage Breeds Week. Well, if you go to the livestockconservancy.org website, And then you click on the second click at the top, it'll say home, and then what we do. If you go to what we do and hover over that, and then you can scroll down about halfway, it'll say Heritage Breeds Week, and that can give you more information about what's going on. And uh, I think if you you can sign up with the Livestock Conservancy to get on their newsletter list as well. And And there should be a 2020 press release that comes out on May the 17th, which should be today when this is being broadcast for the first time. Excellent. Well, thank you again so much. And I look forward to talking to you uh, next week. 
It's been a pleasure. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Kathy. I really had a blast chatting with her. And if you enjoyed that, you're not going to want to miss next week's episode as we really dive into how heritage breeds really have played an integral part in her homesteading journey. I think you're really, really going to find it very informative and enjoyable. I do have links to her website, to her book uh, in the show notes. So please check those out. There are also links to my website, thehomesteadjourney.net. Also, our Facebook and Instagram accounts are there in the show notes as well. If you would like to get a hold of me, you can reach me at brian at thehomesteadjourney.net. I would love to hear your feedback, or you can also contact me via our social media accounts. Um, I have had a number of people reach out to me via our Facebook and Instagram accounts, and I just love hearing from you. I really appreciate your encouraging words. If you have any kind of questions or any kind of constructive feedback, I would love to hear that as well, so you can reach out to me via any one of those avenues. As always, the music on this episode was provided by Audionautics.com, so a big shout out to them, and until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.